Hey, welcome to week two of our series, Literally. Literally is a trending word right now. Um, I, I knew that I was, I was risking being too trendy going after this series that maybe we don't actually hear the word literally as much as we literally say it, uh, but it is there. You say it a lot. It is a trending word, something that we use to explain and describe things that are not literally happening. It's one of those funny words. It can be used literally and figuratively. But before we begin today, I just want to, uh, real quick before we start, say that uh, at this very moment, our country is more divided than I think it's ever been in years and years and years, uh, especially with what's happening politically. Um, I just want to remind you that a bird has a left wing and a right wing, and both wings attach to the same body. Both wings attach to the same body. Okay, so the only thing that we have to have in common today is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. So if you were expecting me to preach something else, that's not gonna happen today, all right? Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I must be all things to all men that I might reach people. And the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be the thing that we're preaching, sharing the good news of God's love, amen? amen. We're in this series called Literally, and today I literally want to share with you the great commandment, the great commandment. Do you know what the great commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great commandment. We're all commanded to do this, and I need to be honest with you today. Um, I have not always done this well. I have not always loved my neighbors well. This one time specifically when I failed miserably. Um, years ago, I was plowing snow and I, I plowed the snow out of one driveway across the street and I pushed it into the, the neighbor's side of the road and uh, a person came out screaming at me that I pushed snow on his, drive, on his road, on his yard and blah, blah, blah. And, and um, I, I wasn't really in the mood to let my light shine and show the love of Jesus. So we exchanged words. Uh, it almost came to blows. Let me tell you that. It got heated over some snow that was going to melt. I'm not going to tell you how the story ends, but it didn't go much further than that. We'll just say that. Um, I did not let my light shine. I did not love my neighbor in that moment. I, I failed at the great commandment. And maybe that's happened to you before as well. Maybe your neighbor's dog keeps using your front lawn as a toilet or a tree of your neighbor's is growing over the fence and putting leaves all in your yard and it bothers you. I think that we could admit that it's easy to love people that love us. It's easy to love people who believe the way that we believe. It's easy to love people who vote the way that we vote. That's it, no more, I'm not going any further. We all know though, that it can be a trying of our faith to be nice to people who treat us poorly. It can be a trying of our faith to love someone who uses harsh words towards us. And so we need to ask this question today. Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment, the, the, the great commandment that we're supposed to live by is to love your neighbor by yourself, as yourself. So let's ask this question. Did Jesus literally expect us to love all our neighbors? Because Jesus, you don't really know who my neighbors are. Right? Maybe you've lived in different neighborhoods throughout your life and you've had really great neighbors and you've had some really bad neighbors. He doesn't literally mean that I have to love them. They're nasty to me. They're mean to me. They fight with me. I have to love them? And then there's this whole definition of love. Do I have to love them like I love hot dogs? 
Do I have to love them like I love my pets? Do I have to love them like I love my spouse and my kids? Well, what kind of love do I have to show this person who doesn't treat me nicely? Well, God has much to say about this topic. And I wanna spend the, the, the remainder of our time looking at 12 verses in the Bible. 12 verses in the Bible, I wanna read through it. And then I'm gonna go back down and I wanna break it apart to look at exactly what's happening in this passage, okay? We're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, and verse 25, and it says this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus. So we first have to understand that this man is very educated. He's very learned. He's a lawyer. He's gone to school. He knows what he's talking about. And in this time, I said I was going to read it all and not explain, right? I'm sorry. In this time, smart people love to show how smart they are. It's a lot like today. Smart people love to show how smart they are, so they will ask questions that they already know the answer to, just to see if you know what they're talking about. Huh? Ever done that before? All right. A certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus. He said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he said, the, the lawyer responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he w wanted to justify himself to Jesus. Jesus says, I mean, and so the man says to him, and who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Then Jesus answered, indeed, a certain man. So Jesus isn't going to give him an answer. Jesus is going to give him a story. Okay? Jesus isn't giving him an answer. He's giving him a story. He's going to make this guy decide. You choose in my story who your neighbor is. Ready? A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. By now, chance a certain priest came down the, that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. A priest. Oh, Lord, help him. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and passed by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he sent him on his own animal. He brought him to an inn and gave a denarii, paid the innkeeper to let him stay there, and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come back, I'll repay you to a total stranger. Put him up in the Holiday Inn. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So now, in order for us to understand the gravity of this story that Jesus told, we have to know some history here, okay? This man goes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus asks him a question right back. You're gonna ask me a question? I'm not gonna give you an answer. I'm gonna ask you a question. He says, what's written? What's written? And how do you read it? You have to understand that strict Orthodox Jews wore around their wrist a little leather box called the phylacteries. Phylacteries. Uh, it contained this little leather pouch that contained passages of scripture. 
that they would go to the, wall, to, to the wailing wall or they would go to the temple and they would open this up and they would read these passages of scripture aloud. It was a reminder of what laws they needed to live by. The passages were Exodus 13, one through 10. They were Deuteronomy 6, four through nine and Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21. And so he says to them, look inside your little box. He's saying to him, what's in your hand? You have the answer in your hand. What's in your hand? Why are you asking me to solve your riddle when you have the answer in your hands? And I just want to throw it out there to you today. If you've got a Bible with you or your smartphone, the answer's in your hands. The answer's in your hands. Anytime you've got a scripture, you've got an answer. All right? He says, you've got the answer in your own hands. You tell me. These specific scribes, this one who is testing Jesus, this specific lawyer was part of a sect of scribes who added an extra scripture to their phylactery. They added Leviticus 19.18. And Leviticus 19.18, which was in his box, said, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This passage of scripture was in his box. This passage commands a man to love his neighbor as himself. So, the rabbis, being, passion, being passionate for definition, they had to determine, they had to define who is one's neighbor. And by these people, this group of Jewish people, they decided that one's neighbor was one's fellow Jew. Our own people are our neighbor. I'm supposed to love my own people. So when Jesus throws out this story, this kind of throws a monkey wrench in this guy's design. Wait a second. Wait a second. I've been taught that to love my neighbor meant to love my fellow Jew. You just said, you just told me a story that does not align with my definition. All right, I'm just going to go here today. Um, can you mind if I just step in it today? Go ahead. All right. Be careful trying to find a church that preaches only what you agree with. <laughs> we have to understand the whole counsel of the gospel. If you only find a church that you agree with every single thing they preach, it might not be stretching you. This guy just heard a message that went against everything he was ever taught. See, the scribe, in an effort to justify himself and correctly identify the scripture of eternal life, still had a flaw in his theology. He still had a flaw in the way he was perceiving his neighbor. So let's see, what does the scripture literally mean? Do you literally have to love all your neighbors or just the people who look like you? Do you have to love all your neighbors or people who just dance the way you dance? Do I have to love all my neighbors or just people who think the way I think and believe the way I believe? In response, Jesus relays the story called the Good Samaritan. Now the title of the story already annoys Jews because there could never be a good Samaritan. Samaritans were dogs to them. They were like a mix between, they believed some of the Jewish customs, but they also believed some of the outlandish, weird stuff. 
So even calling the story Good Samaritan offends this Jewish teacher, this lawyer. But let's look at some things. The, the story starts on a very popular road, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this road was an extremely dangerous road to travel. You see, Jerusalem was 2,300 feet above sea level. Pretty high. The Dead Sea near Jericho was 1,300 feet below sea level. That's why the Dead Sea was dead. Everything kind of went into it. So Jerusalem, 2,300 feet above sea level. Jericho, 1,300 feet below sea level in a course of 20 miles. So you were coming straight down a mountain to this place. It dropped some 3,600 feet over 20 miles. It was narrow, it had rocky cliffs, and it had sudden turns, which made it a perfect place for thieves to rob you, okay? The fifth century historian Jerome called this road the red or bloody way. So when Jesus told this story, he was telling about the kind of thing that was constantly happening on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. They know full well how dangerous this road was. So today I wanna to go through a couple of the characters in this story, and I wanna ask if you identify with any one of these characters. If you were in this story today, which person would you be in the story? Let's look at the traveler. He's the first character. There's this man who's traveling. He was obviously a reckless person. He was daring and foolish because seldom people traveled this road alone. And if they did, it, wasn't, it was because they weren't carrying any valuables. If they were carrying valuables, they would ask for other people to come to help protect them along the way. This man had no one with him. Therefore, he had no one to blame but himself for putting himself in this situation. He should have used the buddy system like Miss Cindy spoke about the other day, right? Should have used the buddy system, but he didn't. And I just wanna throw this out there. Before we get all hard on him because he, he made a bad choice and, and, and he did this to himself, we've all made a lot of bonehead decisions that put ourselves in bad spots where the only person to blame was us, right? We can understand this, okay. Then we have the priest. The priest hurried past. No doubt that he remembered the law and the teachings that if he touched a dead body, he would be ceremonially unclean for seven days. He could not be sure if this man was dead or alive, and so he decided, I'm not gonna risk it. I'm not gonna put myself in an unclean situation. I'm gonna jump on the other side of the road, and I'm just gonna go right by. He set ceremony above charity. He put ceremony above charity. He put image above caring for a neighbor. Throwing that out there. Then you have the Levite. He seemed to kind of like look for a moment, but then he remembered that bandits would use decoys sometimes. They'd have somebody laying in their own, uh, uh, and when you go to help, bam, now a group of people jump out, they attack you, they rob you. And so he couldn't be sure if this was a decoy, if this was a trick. So his motto was safety first, self-preservation, and he too was unwilling to step in and help. Have you found yourself yet? Then we got the Good Samaritan. Unlike the others, he was willing to risk his own safety 
in order to help this man. Now, he may not have been under the correct teachings of the temple. He may not have known the things that the, that the priest knew. He may not have understood that he would be ceremonially unclean if he touches a dead body. We don't know. We don't know his understanding. But we do know that he had a love for others. He had a love for others. I just want to show you today, we are all a character somewhere in this story. We have either been guilty of the Christian drive-by. Oh, you ain't never heard of the Christian drive-by? You know what the Christian drive-by is? You see somebody straight on the side of the road and you say, oh Lord, send somebody to help them. <laughs> That's what these guys did. The Christian drive-by. Lord, send laborers. He did. You are there right now. My wife constantly begs me to not get out of the car and get myself into situations because I am the guy, I stop at everything. Um, and I have put myself in some pretty scary situations by stopping, uh, trying to stop things. I'll tell you this quick story real quick, just two seconds. Um, we were on a motorcycle trip, me and my dad and some of his friends, and this fist fight breaks out on the side of the road. And so I'm, I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna break this thing up, right? Get these guys broken apart. So. I, you know, I get off my bike and I start heading over to break this fight up and my dad grabs me by my, um, my leather vest and literally like pulls me back almost to fall on the ground. And I'm like, what are you doing, dad? They're like pounding each other, blah, blah, blah. And so the fight's kind of over, it kind of breaks up and the cops are coming and this guy pulls up his pant leg and pulls this big knife out and goes and throws it in the weeds. And my dad's like, that's why I pulled you away from that fight. Now he didn't see no knife but you get what I'm saying. And so it's stories like that that make us the Levite. I'm not jumping in. I don't know what's gonna happen to me. I don't know what they're gonna do, right? We can all find ourselves in this story today. Maybe there are times that we were the Samaritan. Maybe times we were the priest. Maybe times we were the Levite. Maybe sometimes we were the person on the side of the road saying, God, send anybody to help me, send anybody to help me. I'm hurting and I don't know who I can talk to. I don't know who I can trust. I don't know who if they find the worst things out about me will still love me. Mm. God's literally calling us to care for others and to love all our neighbors. So let's look at the big takeaway. Let's look at the big takeaway today. There's four things that I want you to get out of this message today. Four things. The first one is this. We must be willing to help others even if they brought the trouble on themselves. I'm gonna talk frank for a second. It's easy to get to your end when dealing with someone who has an addiction. It's easy to get to a spot where we say, you did it to yourself, you keep doing it to yourself and I'm done with you. I thank God that Jesus has never done that to me. I thank God. 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 But I know that it's also easy to be the person on the other side who gets, who is done. I can understand it. Again, two wings of the same bird. It's about perspective. It's about how we're viewing people. It's how we love those people around us. I love the hidden truth in this story. The hidden truth is this guy brought this on himself because he put himself in a known situation that he should not have been in. And I'm going to tell you this, most of the times we find ourselves in trouble, that's exactly what has happened. 
We did something that was not the smartest choice. Three people would not stop and help him either out of judgment, look at this fool, or self-preservation. The second truth is anyone of any cultural background who is in need is your neighbor. Ooh. Anyone of any sort of background, of any sort of nationality, of any sort of religious belief, anyone who has human skin is your neighbor. Let me tell you like this. The ground at the foot of the cross is level ground. The ground at the foot of the cross is level ground. There's no one who gets to stand on a hill higher under the cross. It is level ground. And it is wide enough for all of us to approach him. Here's the third truth that we find in this story. To obey God and love one's neighbor, it might involve some risk. It might involve some misunderstanding. It might involve looking the wrong way. It might involve upsetting someone else who's given up on the person that you're called to help. Ah. But that risk is especially worth it if by taking that risk, it leads someone to Jesus. If it leads somebody to Jesus. The whole point of this was leading to hope, healing, restoration. The last point I wanna make today is life is dangerous if you try to go at it alone. Life is dangerous if you try to go at it alone. That's what the traveler found out. And that's what many people in this world find out. That's what we're finding out right now. There's a lot of lonely people right now during this pandemic. During shutdowns and shut-ins and staying at home and distancing, people are finding themselves lonelier than ever before. We live in a society where, it can, where we can easily cut people off and then stalk them on Facebook upset at them. <laughs> this is why Christian community is so important. Christian community is so important. Our commitment to living a life in a community of believers, that we would not let the body of Christ be divided for any reason. Look at this in John 13, 34, up on the screen. A new command I give you, love one another in the way that I loved you. He's not just saying, well, I loved you, so love people. He says, no, love each other the way, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples. By what? By your love. By your love. Your love is the evidence of being a disciple of Jesus. Your love, oh my gosh. Your love is the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. Your love is the evidence of salvation. Your love, not your ability to be right. People don't care that you're always right. They care that you're real with them. And that there's a real love beyond differences, beyond differences. Come on, somebody, come on. As we take this truth and put it along the side of the fact that it's a commandment, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Right there, that's struggle enough. That's struggle enough. Cause let's just think about that for a second. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, it doesn't leave a whole lot of room in your heart to love other things. 
that's a hard one. That, that's like, so especially if you're married and got kids. Like, I love my family, I love my children. And so that actually has to shrink a little bit so that I can love God with all my heart. Think about it for a second. Think about what the commandment is. Now he goes on, all your heart, which is almost impossible, all your soul, so all your thoughts. I shouldn't be thinking about anything outside of loving God. And then with all my strength. Oh, and then throw on top of that, love your neighbor who doesn't like you at all. We got our hands full, y'all, with just love. But here's the truth today. God literally expects you to be the light of love shining in the darkness of this world. He literally expects you to be a lamp that's shining on the hilltop that cannot be dimmed, that you would not put a basket over the light of the love of Jesus. He literally expects us to love to see our neighbor when they come walking down the street, that love would emanate from us. And by that love, people would know that you are his disciple. And then if you would lift him up, he would draw people to him. He's going to draw people to him through you. And your love is the key that opens that door. I'm not talking about door-to-door -door witnessing. I'm not talking about going and trying to get people saved. I'm talking about the love revolution that God wants to begin in the land today. That when someone sees you, there's a difference in you. And by the difference, the difference is they see that you're a disciple. That's what he says. By your love, people know. I know there's something different about you. What is it? How come you're happy when everything else is crazy? How, how can you be okay right now with everything that's happening? Well, because I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Jesus follower. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Deep down in my spirit, I have a strong urging that there is going to be, if it has not already begun, a significant spiritual revival coming out of the back end of this pandemic. That, that the Holy Spirit has a new work to begin to do that's not gonna look like old ways. It's easy for Christian church to want revival of the miraculous, of the, of the weird stuff. But I'll tell you, the next greatest move that God wants to do coming out of the back end of this pandemic will be through everyday normal believers who have put their trust in Jesus. And in simple prayers, on sides of the road, or at the lunch table, or, or, or at a, a, a house, that, that healings will happen in everyday occurrences. That, that during worship services, people will be worshiping and, and deaf ears will open. And, and as we're worshiping, a blind eye will open. And, and as we're worshiping, somebody who came in with pain in their body, the pain leaves, not because of one great man or, or the prophet of God, but because believers, the church universal, got their hearts right that they understand the grace of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness for one another. I see a forgiveness revolution, a forgiveness revolution, that as you forgive those who've wronged you, you will see supernatural healing happen in your body. If you hold unforgiveness, it, has, it is as cancer to your body. But through forgiveness, through forgiveness, the forgiveness that came to you, you then just reflect it as a light of love to someone else. Healings are going to be happening in people's bodies. I do not say this to be weird. 
Trust me when I tell you, I fought even bringing this up. But there has to be a spiritual awakening. There has to be a revival in the, in the hearts and the lives of believers coming out of this pandemic. There has to be. There has to be. If not, we're gonna continue down the same trend of becoming lukewarm believers. Scattered from church, scattered from gathering together. But I'm telling you this, when the church of God gets desperate enough for a move of God, things begin to happen in the spirit realm. God literally wants to use you in the next season. In this next season, God wants to use you. And you don't have to feel it. You don't have to get the spiritual goosebumps down your back that God was there and did it. All you have to do is obey. All you have to do is obey. We have to stop sending prayer emojis and actually pray. Please love me enough that if I ever ask you to pray, don't just send me a pray emoji. Actually stop and pray for me. All right? God literally desires that we love our neighbors, which includes praying for your neighbors, helping your neighbor, believing the best about your neighbor, and also not pushing snow across the street into their lawn and starting a fight. We are literally God's example. We're examples of Jesus Christ in the earth today. Are you demonstrating that? Father, we thank you for your word today that it will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our helper, our comforter, and our guide. Help us, God, to love our neighbor. I will be the first to stand in front of all these people and say, Lord, I haven't, got it. I haven't always got it right. I haven't always got it right, even loving my own Christian brother. So Lord, I ask you, if we've done those things, forgive us, cleanse us, wash us, renew our minds, help us. Your word says that he who keeps his mouth, keeps his life and keeps him from destruction. So help us to only utter words that are life-giving and uplifting to those who would hear them. Help us to keep our mouth. Help us to hold back words that would tear others down and hurt them. Lord, if we have said things that have hurt others, I ask you to forgive us. Help us to stand before you renewed all things new and forgetting what's behind and pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call. I thank you for the season of the church that we're stepping into, God. Help us. Give us wisdom beyond our years. Give us the words to speak. Bless everything that we set our hands to. Let them prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you.